uh, and uh, even to 120 frames per second. And uh, we also have heard that uh, it might be good to switch uh, within a movie between different frame rates. And now I think we come to the point where this uh, might be possible. And uh, I'm happy that Tim Ryan from Texas Instruments will show us what is possible today and how we can achieve this. Uh, Tim Ryan is a senior software and systems architect for the enterprise and cinema display business within uh, DLP products at Texas Instruments. He has been part of the DLP cinema team at TI since 2002. Yeah, please, Tim. Thank you, Phil. Yeah. Uh, my name is Tim Ryan, and I've been working with DLP cinema for the last 15 years, which means when I started, we were doing something called Series 1. And for people that remember uh, Digital Cinema Series 1, TI did all of the electronics all the way to the outside of the projector. So everything from the BNC connector on the side of the projector all the way to the digital micrometer device that reflected the light through the projection lens onto the screen. In about 2010, uh, that transitioned over into what we called Series 2, you know, where TI took uh, the internal electronics and defined an internal interface and left those external connections and more of the processing to our partners, our DLP cinema partners. And, but TI was still responsible for, at the end of the day, flipping the mirrors. We've now transitioned to even a lot of that cinema processing, the rendering of the subtitles, those types of actions to our, we've explained that to our partners and they are able to do that themselves. And so what people are calling series three for lack of a better word, that's not what TI calls it, but uh, you've probably heard that name already. Uh, TI will be responsible for flipping the mirrors, but everything upstream will be responsible of, of our partners. So that's important to remember as we go through this. So what's the problem that we're trying to solve? Motion pictures have been captured and presented at 24 frames a second for a really long time, like since sound was added to the motion picture experience because that happened to be a nice frame rate for all the audio to work. But as we've seen, there's been a lot of recent advancements in capturing and presenting at other higher frame rates. So at 48 or at 60 or at 120 frames per second. And the improvements that come along that are less blur, less judder. Uh, James Cameron likes to call it strobing, okay? That really bugs James, okay, is the fact that in 3D, you see things that move from this position to this position instantaneously, and it looks like a strobe is going across the screen if you have fast camera movements. Uh, in about 2011, in say January, uh, my boss got a call, and it was Jim Cameron, and he said, how fast will a Series 2 projector go? And my boss asked me, how fast does a Series 2 projector go? And I said, 120 frames a second. So he says, 120 frames a second. And James says, thanks, bye, click. And I said, who was asking? <laughs> he said, oh, that was James Cameron. Okay, why did he want to know? <laughs> he said, well, I don't know, I didn't ask him. I'm like, well, just because the TI electronics will go 120 frames a second does not mean that every, you can get 120 frames a second into the projector. This is series two, we're not responsible for that anymore. And he went, oh, okay, so he calls back and says, you know, why do you wanna know? And he says, I wanna give a demo at CinemaCon, which is in March, and this is January. <laughs> and we said, okay, we probably need to work together on this. So we worked together and they gave a successful demo of the difference, the same scene shot, 24 frames a second per eye 3D, 48 frames per second per eye 3D, and 60 frames per second per eye 3D, and what it looked like, okay? And everybody was, you know, oh, high frame rate is the greatest thing in the world, right? And for the last, five, six years, okay, it's been on every presentation at every topic, you know, high frame rate. So gotta have more pixels, gotta have more frames, gotta have more, 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 right? Well, when you have higher frame rate, you've also increased the cost in storage, in production, in time, okay? And there's also been some negative reaction to high frame rate. 
And people have said that it looks like video. People have said it looks like a soap opera. People have said it has a lack of cinematic feel. Well, what if we could have the quality of HFR without all the cost? And we could determine the look from scene to scene. So what would that take? The projector would need to vary the frame rate during a presentation. And that way, the scenes that benefit from higher frame rate can be shown at a higher frame rate, and those that don't require it don't have to be. Please be aware that I'm going to discuss all of this from the vantage point of the projector, okay? Because that's what I'm familiar with. That's what I do. So what do we need to do to solve this problem? You know, is there a button? Is there an easy button that I can push, okay, to solve this problem? I'm going to define variable frame rate as that ability to change the input frame rate to the projector during a presentation and have no visible artifacts before, during, or after that transition from one frame rate to another. So what would it actually take to make that happen? I contend that there's at least four pieces to this puzzle that I'm going to talk about. For knowledge of the future frame rate, the frame rate needs to be communicated throughout the entire system deterministically and sufficiently in advance. And we'll go into what sufficiently in advance means. The projector must store a minimum of two sets of frame rate specific data. Okay, and nobody knows what frame rate specific data is, but I'm going to give you a little glimpse into what a DLP cinema projector needs for frame rate specific data. And then the projector has to switch from one to the other without anybody noticing it. So, foreknowledge. It's a big word, what does that mean? Does that mean that I have to be psychic? I wanted a picture of Johnny Carson with, this, with the Swami hat, you know, the great Karnak, but uh, apparently that wasn't on Adobe stock photos, so I got this picture instead. The answer to this question is no, I don't have to be psychic. A SMPTE DCP, already includes the frame rate information for every piece of content. For the video, for the audio, for the subtitles, for the closed caption, every single reel, every single piece of content has this edit rate embedded in it, okay? So there's a constraints document that says for a composition, every essence, every piece of that composition shall have the same edit rate. But what if that weren't true? What if each portion, each reel, each scene could have its own edit rate? When the server takes this composition and unwraps it and unpackages it, it knows already every single time point where it changes from reel one to reel two, reel two to reel three, and it already knows the edit rates in advance. All it has to do is pass that knowledge along, pass it down the chain. So, how might that work? The second puzzle piece, got to have communication. So the server already communicates information to the rest of the projection system. So let's take advantage of the mechanism that we're already using. There's something called ancillary data or metadata that rides along with the video frames. It's the first active line of video, but it's got headers in it that says, oh, by the way, this isn't an active line of video, this is really metadata. It includes things like time code, so that I know what time it is to put a subtitle up or take a subtitle down. It includes information about 3D. Is this a left frame, is this a right frame? What is this? The format for that line of video follows a SMPTE standard, ST291-1, used to be 291M. All we're suggesting is that we define a new data packet that provides both the current and the future frame rates. So while this is the metadata, this is the new packet. This is the new information. This is the payload, okay? And it's two pieces of data. It's current frame rate and it's next frame rate. It's an integer number of frames. It's 24. It's 36. It's whatever the frame rate is. People get confused when they read next frame rate. This is not necessarily the frame rate for the next frame. It is the next frame rate that the projector needs to get ready to handle. Okay, so it's a future frame rate. Okay, so let's take a little look at what an example might be. Okay, here is a made up 
set of reels that I made up in my mind. I said, reel one runs from frame number one to 14,400. That's 10 minutes at 24 frames a second. And for that 10 minutes, I am sending with every single frame of video in that one line of metadata, this information. The current frame rate is 24. The next frame rate is gonna be 48. So from frame one, I'm telling the projector, you better get ready to handle 48 because it's coming sooner or later. The second frame, the second reel, might only be 30 seconds. So you might only have a 30 second portion that needs to be running at 48. Then you might go back to 24 for another five minutes. Then you might go to 92 for 26 seconds. Then you might go the rest of the movie all at 24. That's fine. The important thing is a reel can be any length you want. It doesn't have to be 20 minutes. And successive reels don't have to have different frame rates. Reels five through eight are a normal movie. There's, there's no reason to change what everybody is doing now. If it's 24 frames a second and the next one is 24 frames a second and the next one is 24 frames a second, just tell me. It's 24 frames a second. I'm fine. So the third puzzle piece, the projector storage. DLP cinema projectors require storage not just for the image data, not just for this frame of video that I'm going to display, but also for what I'm calling frame rate specific information. So remember, in DLP, the, the DMD, the digital micromere device, is a digital device. Okay? It's got 2 million micromirrors in a 2K. It's got 8 million micromirrors in a 4K display. Each one of those mirrors is digitally controllable and can be turned towards the light or away from the light. If it's towards the light, light reflects off of it and goes back through a projection lens and you get a bright spot on the screen. If it's away from the light, the light never enters the projection lens, you get a dark spot. So you can think about the way that I build up an intensity similar to the way that motion pictures create motion. We all watch motion pictures, but nothing is moving, okay? All you're really seeing is a bunch of still images, one after the other. And your eyes and your mind put that together and say, look, looks like it's moving. In a similar fashion, if you compress that thought process down to a single frame time, for 24 hertz, that's 41 milliseconds. In 41 milliseconds, I am going to build up an intensity for every single pixel on the screen by turning these mirrors digitally on or off. So to build up an intensity for a pixel, I might say it's on, 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 it's on. There's a pattern, okay? And that pattern to be the most efficient that it can at distributing the energy over the entire 41 milliseconds is different for 24 hertz than it is for 29 hertz, than it is for 32 hertz, than it is for 47 hertz, than it is for 96 hertz. They are a different set of instructions. They're actually instructions that get executed on how to load which bit planes when. We call that a sequence. So there's these different instruction sets, and then there's different specific data to aid in the temporal uh, and spatial multiplexing, okay, to make it look uniform. The good thing is, in DLP Cinema Series 3 that we talked about, so the latest generation of things that TI has delivered to our customers, there's double the, door, the storage space and it's set up in a double buffered mechanism, which means you can be running out of one while you're loading the other. So how might that work? When I wanna switch frame rates, the current frame rate and the next frame rate, remember, are sent with every frame and they're monitored with every frame. When the current frame rate has changed and is now equal to the next frame rate from the previous frame, what's called a swap occurs. Okay, and I swap from one of those buffers to the other buffer. So in that previous example, the first three lines out of there, the first three reels, okay, you can see this happening at frame number 14,401. At that frame, the current frame rate is now 48. And at frame 14,400, 
The next frame rate was 48. That's the transition. I do not need a separate trigger. All I need to do is watch this metadata that comes with every frame, and I'm looking at it anyway so I can pull out time code and everything else. The swap occurs at a frame boundary, so there's no disturbance on screen. And now I've got the other buffer that I can be loading with the new next frame rate. Okay, and I can ping pong back and forth between these two buffers. And remember, I had 10 minutes to load that 48 frame per second frame rate specific data. In real number two, I have 30 seconds. Again, DLP Cinema Series 3 supports this today. Okay. The portion that TI provides to our partners. It's not saying that you can go out and buy a projector today and just throw this metadata in there and it just all happens. Okay. But the hardware is there, the firmware is there, the software is there to support it on the TI end of things. So what do, what do we want to use this for? Why do we want to use this? Okay. I think there's, there's three different use cases. There's yesterday's content, there's today's content, and there's tomorrow's content. Yesterday's content. I got a call a couple of years ago from a gentleman named John Erland. John is back in the back of the auditorium. John and his wife Kay and everyone else who's working at the Pickford Institute for Cinematic Studies is doing a fantastic service to the motion picture industry. When John described what he was doing, I wanted to be able to help. He, he came to me and he's made a presentation at this conference before on uh, digitally showing archival films, digital projection of archival films. So John was explaining to me how you know, these movies were shot at 16 frames a second or 18 frames a second or 22 frames a second or 40 frames per second. You know, and he wanted to be able to play back any of them. How could I do this? So I put him in touch with a few people on the server side to help out, okay? But I said, sure, the DLP cinema projectors will do that. Remember, somebody calls me up on the phone and says, how fast does a DLP cinema projector go? And I say, 120 frames a second. They say, thanks, bye. No, John did not say, thanks, bye. <laughs> he wanted more information. So I, I gave him the information and, and he was able to, through frame rate multiplication by you know, doubling up and tripling up frames, okay, achieve the same display as the original content had. In addition, the other thing that John told me was he has handwritten notes from filmmakers pre-sound that said to the projectionist, they were instructions that said for the first 10 minutes of this movie, crank the projector at 16 frames a second, okay, because the camera was cranked at 16 frames a second. For the next two minutes after that, I want you to crank the projector at 22 because that's the effect that I want. And John said, how do I do that? And I said, that's a really good question. <laughs> I don't know how you do that. <laughs> so, but that, that kind of got me thinking down these lines of, all right, what would it actually take to change frame rates on the fly? How could you do this? John's been doing some fantastic work. If you do not know John, please get to know John Erlen. Today's content, advertising pre-show might be at 60 frames a second, okay? Could you seamlessly transition that into your 2D trailers at 24? Could you seamlessly translate, transfer into 48 frames per second 3D? Sure, can you do it now? Sure, you put about two seconds of black in the middle, okay, so that while well, we're changing everything and loading up all the next frame rate and frame rate specific information, you don't see a disturbance on screen, okay? You wouldn't have to do that. What about tomorrow? I propose that we're, and I know there are people that love this and people that hate this, okay? I'm providing another tool for the toolbox. I'm providing another color to the palette. I'm providing something else for somebody to spend time on, right? But it's more than that, okay? It's creative freedom. It allows filmmakers to make art. Okay. There's, there's no reason why everything has to be presented at exactly the same frame rate. It turns out this should be less cost to the studios. Okay. If I had to make a two-hour movie at 120 frames per second, 
per eye, 4K, 3D. How much money does the studio spend on producing that movie? And how many people are going to see it that way? It's less time in post, okay? Think about every person who has to go in and touch every frame. It has to outline every lightsaber, okay, at 120 frames per second. It's a time saving. And while it may not be back to the future, maybe we can call it forward to the past, okay? It's new, or albeit old, experiences for the audience. Okay, it gives them something that they have not seen in 100 years. Okay, the ability to change the display rate on the fly. So, variable frame rate. I contend that you have to have foreknowledge, communication, the increased storage, and smooth transitions. And what I want to say is Texas Instruments is not out of the digital cinema business. Texas Instruments continues to invest, to innovate, to add things to the cinema experience. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Tim. So I think there are some questions in the auditorium. Yeah, here in the middle. Uh, by the way, do we have a microphone? Wireless microphone? No. Okay, so yeah. you have to speak loud. <laughs> it seems like the standards you're proposing give sufficient information for a technology like a DLC yes. to make the transition so that you can be ready for the transition to the public offering. Um, have you considered, rather than what signals and what frame rate is going to be, when the transition would be, such that the standard might support a different display technology that would require some time to, you know, more, more so than just the normal offering, but let's say, I, while that's possible, certainly, um, there's nothing in here that I mentioned about how far in advance you had to tell it. So that, that is still something that, that's left to be decided, okay? Even though I may be able to load everything that I need in 12 frames, okay, that doesn't mean that every system could. You're right, okay? And so that could be done through the standards. Okay, right now, it, there's a constraints document that says a reel shall be no shorter than one second. Well, one second might not be a good minimum number for use cases like that. Maybe five seconds, maybe 10 seconds, maybe, you know, come up with a number, okay? But I'm not proposing a number here. You're right. Yeah, please. I have talked to a couple of different media block manufacturers, yes, so they're aware of this. And from, from different discussions with different people, as long as they can support the highest rate that you want to go to, they don't care. Somebody upstream, somebody else provides a master clock to them. Okay, so as long as they have sufficient bandwidth to decode 120 frames a second at whatever resolution. This is the communication that I've had to this point. We have not gone into depth with discussions with media block manufacturers yet, no. Okay, one question from my side. What is the maximum switch rate? Uh, would it be uh, one second, every second, so that you switch? So, yeah, this, I'm not envisioning this as being uh, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28 frames per second and on successive yeah, frames. Yeah, you can make a dynamic right. ramp or something you, like you, this. You could, I don't think that's necessarily a use case that needs to be pursued. <laughs> um, it, I envision this more as being scene-based. 
So this scene has fast motion. This scene has a fast camera pan, okay? So it requires a higher frame rate, okay? The next scene doesn't, okay? So I, I envision more jumps than, than dynamic ramps. There are ways to do dynamic ramps, and, and we can discuss offline if you'd like. <laughs> but but it's a little more, there's a little more to it. Yeah, Bill? I've got one comment and one question. Okay. Correct. Correct. Yep. And then there was some delay in the video pipeline before a pixel appeared on the screen, and there needed to be a matching delay in the audio system to see the audio picture come out to the audience simultaneously. Yep. But now that it sounds like that video pipeline is going to change its latency. Three frames is not the same amount of time when you change frame rates. That's absolutely true. That will have to be comprehended. Yes, it is. <laughs> no, I do not have a solution for that today. <laughs> okay, but uh, uh, Bill mentioned that uh, typically you have discrete uh, frame rates defined uh, for video and audio. So for me, the question is, uh, is it uh, uh, in the moment only supported the actual standardized frame rates or also uh, you can use in principle all possible frame rates, in principle, besides that it's not defined in a DCP, but? In principle, any frame rate between 20 and 120. Okay. Any other question? <coughs> not, then thank you very much.